A hundred years after immigrants formed a nation in Patria, an energy ore called Somnium was discovered, which sparked a civil war that split the nation. As the Southern Confederation greatly outnumbered the Northern Union, they dominated the war. The Union charged at the enemy fortress, powering through the countless cannons and bullets shot their way. When all troops were about to be taken out, a group clad in white appeared. With the leader's order to attack, one suddenly transformed into a dragon and blasted the fortress wall with fire. The rest followed, transforming into various monsters and invading the enemy. With the gap between their powers clear, the South was quickly overwhelmed. Fearing defeat, the North used forbidden technology and created modified humans, hideous soldiers who overran battlefields in seconds. Likened to gods, they were called incarnates. With the enemy base captured, the Major confirms the rumors about Sergeant Major Hank and his team. As they leave, the Lieutenant wonders if such powerful beings can be trusted. They enter Elaine's tent, and the comrade is glad to see them alive. Kane remarks that that wouldn't have been the case if the Major outside was their captain. Telling him to quiet down, she reports on the soldiers, who showed little progression in the battle. Feeling responsible for creating the Incarnates, she vows to figure something out. With his friend whining about their unusual cheesiness, Hank runs out of the tent, flustered. Their squad enjoys the free time after the battle, and Roy asks the dragon man, Will, about his daughter, Shal. As they bicker and joke around, the captain arrives and innocently joins in on the conversation. A woman jokingly reminds him of Elaine and how he should only have eyes for her. Hearing this, the others add on, saying he shouldn't take too long and shape up, as the doctor might be waiting for him as well. Pressured, he looks away and says he'll think about it after the war. The disappointing conversation quickly ends as the deputy and doctor arrive. As the days pass by, so does the progression of war, with the incarnates blowing through the enemies and Elaine continuing to treat her people. One afternoon, while the prisoners of war are being gathered, a chilling cry rings out. Abby, a toxic snake incarnate, has snatched men up with his jaws and dissolved their bodies in seconds. He roars uncontrollably and unleashes smog across the camp, endangering both friend and foe. As he continues to attack indiscriminately, Hank runs to him to take control. However, he's shocked as his subordinate's head turns to him, saying he isn't moving on his own and begging the captain to stop him. Fearing for their lives, the soldiers barrage him with cannons and he falls back into his human form. Repeating that he can't control himself, he ignores the captain's calls for a medic and takes his own life. Later, the rest of the incarnates worry about going through the same thing. Elaine recalls their conversation and how he wondered if he wouldn't be able to transform back into a human one day. He brushed it off as a joke, but something must have been happening already. Despite noticing, she couldn't do anything in the end and can't assure that the same thing won't happen to them. The next day, they burn Abby's remains. Hank frankly says that they can suffer the same fate, but reminds his people that they aren't beasts. To preserve their dignity, he invites everyone to vow that those who lose their souls will be slain by their own. Unable to bear what she's hearing, Elaine returns to her tent and lashes out. The war went on, and the trail of death did not stop for either party. Nearing the end of it, everyone is left ragged and tired. The captain commends them all for pushing so far and says that they will capture the capital the next day. Noticing that his speech isn't bringing the spirits up, Hank reveals that he's going to confess his feelings to the doctor and invites everyone to celebrate with him. With this, he orders everyone to come back alive, successfully lifting the squad's mood. He's hard at work even at night, and Kane recalls when the three of them first met, not expecting that the two war orphans would befriend a rich boy. He tells the captain to take care of Elaine, as he's the only one who can bear the burden with her. Later, the two friends walk to a secluded area. There, the doctor reveals that the war will end without the final fight, as the two nations have been secretly negotiating a ceasefire. The draft of the peace treaty has already been completed, and the North and South will become unified soon. Hank is relieved to hear that peace is upon them. However, they will have no place in that peace. With tears in her eyes, Elaine unexpectedly shoots her friend. All incarnates will eventually lose their human form, as well as their soul. Despite doing everything she could, the doctor couldn't find a way to stop it. If they lose control of their monster form, they'll become the biggest threat in history. As their creator, she has to stop them herself, but also knows that he's too kind to support her mission. Hugging him tight, 
she promises to follow soon. Kane appears, seeming to have agreed to her plan of killing everyone and themselves. To her shock, he shoots her instead and laughs maniacally as she dies. Hank loses consciousness and wakes up in an infirmary. A lieutenant named Liza introduces herself and says he's been in a coma for two months. With the war over, he urgently demands to know what happened to Elaine. She says the doctor has been missing since he was found, adding that his squad disbanded and was scattered by Cain. Unfortunately, most of them lost their sanity and wreaked havoc wherever they went. Countless innocents have died, and the incarnates have now become symbols of terror. Furious, Hank smashes the wall, determined to bring down his former deputy. At night, the captain tracks down an old squadmate and sees the corpses behind him. Remembering their vow to slay those who have lost their souls, he obliterates the incarnate. At the Bancroft Orphanage, Shal calls the children in for tea. While they don't have much of it left, she makes it a point to have tea time every day as a way to relax with everyone. Her father, Will, agrees that it's an important part of life. Later, the father and daughter buy supplies, but are unable to get much, as wartime is constantly making everything expensive. While she's worried about lasting for a month, he says he can finally teach her how to hunt and that they should go right away. With the children, they venture into the woods, where Shal aims a rifle at a grazing deer. However, she hesitates too long and it gets away. They go home with nothing but mushrooms. Seeing his daughter disappointed, Will says it's hard to take something's life. Knowing how strong she is, he assures her that she'll be able to do it when the time comes. Suddenly, they see a couple of soldiers by the door. The man has a long meeting with them, but they leave without any trouble. Later, he tells his daughter that he's being called to war soon. In disbelief, she protests and insists that he should have just declined, no matter what they said. However, they promised to fund the town and orphanage if he went, meaning everyone would eat their fill. She cries, not wanting to accept his decision. Soothing his daughter, he says it's more than just the money and that he wants to end the war to give them a happy life in the future. With this, he eventually boards the carriage to the battlefield and says goodbye to the children, promising to end the war with his special power. Shal gives him a familiar locket, containing a photo of him and the children. After the war, soldiers return to the town with a huge dragon, whom they introduced as Will. While she was afraid at first, the daughter quickly recognized her father's warm smile and eyes. As she welcomes him home, she introduces him to the children, and they hug the beast after overcoming their fear. With his powers, he dedicates the rest of his days to his family, doing whatever he can to be happy together. The town chief gives her their supplies as usual, and offers to help, as her father is their hero. One night, the sky suddenly thundered with Will's roar. His daughter runs to him and receives a menacing glare. A few days later, the villagers complain of their livestock being torn to pieces. They suggest binding the dragon with a metal ball, insisting that it's a way to prove his innocence. Moreover, they've decided that it's not a safe place for the children to stay, and takes them away. Running back to the orphanage, she recalls the precious memories filled with laughter. Left alone, she suggests running far away with her father and building a house in the forest. He walks off into the woods. At night, Shal runs out in the rain as roars cry out following explosions. Deep in the forest, she sees Will, bloodied and fallen, with Hank pointing a gun at his head. The poor girl stared at her father's eyes and ran as the gun clicked and took his life. She wept in the rain, unable to accept what happened. Seeking an explanation for his death, the daughter left her home with a rifle on her back. Going from town to town, she searched for the cloaked man and finally saw him at a pub. Bursting into the establishment, she raised her gun, thinking about her father's brutal killing, and pulled the trigger. The bullet hit the captain's chest, but he simply winced in pain and carried her off into a dark alley. Asked to identify herself, she reveals that she's Will's daughter and asks how he's still alive, despite getting shot in the chest. Their conversation is interrupted, as someone named Danny returns to town. He tells her to hide and walks to the main street, saying another incarnate has appeared. There, the locals welcome the large man who's covered in blood. With a bright tone, he announced his return and laid down a sack of gold coins and jewelry, saying the town would prosper if they sold it. Just then, Hank walked towards him, saying there's been reports of wagons being attacked nearby. As everyone was crushed by a large object, he suspects the towering incarnate. Danny gets mad and demands to know who he is. He steps back 
as he sees his old captain, who reminds him of the oath they made to take each other's lives. Just then, Shal stood between them, questioning if he's going to kill him and trying to defend the man. However, she's proven wrong as Danny transforms into a colossal beast, insisting that he just wants his people to prosper. Hank takes a hit while trying to save the girl, and the fuming incarnate continues his barrage as the townspeople hide in the dark, unable to do anything. The captain appears on his shoulder, unharmed, and impales the beast's chest with his lance. Pulling the line out, the weapon explodes and takes the incarnate out. With sullen eyes, he remembers his squad member's kindness and aims his gun. Danny wonders if he should have just died in the war. With an apology, he pulls the trigger. Shal watches as his mother weeps like she did and demands to know his reasons. He gives vague answers, and as she realizes that clear ones won't be given, she declares that she'll just find out herself by accompanying his journey. The image of her father being shot still echoes in Shal's mind. As fate has it, she's now traveling with the man who killed him mercilessly. Rain pours, and a kind merchant offers them a ride in a carriage. Hank says they're headed to Rogue Hill, and the man can't believe it, as the area is said to house a monster. It's known as the town where war never ends. The young girl is stunned, as she sees a spiked fortress in the middle of town. Just then, Liza appears, complaining about being made to wait. She notices Shal, and condescendingly asks her to leave. Seeing the captain's expression, she drops the tone and politely introduces herself. Getting down to business, she says the fortress was made by the Minotaur, an incarnate who's good at building and has superhuman strength. After the war, he returned to Rogue Hill and began building the fortress, which now grows larger by the day. The problem is that he destroys nearby structures to use as building materials. Shal asks if they're going to kill him, just for being an incarnate. She protests against the idea, believing that they can just convince the Minotaur to stop building. As she insists on her idea, the incarnate roars on top of his fortress and calls on the citizens to prepare for war, reminding them of the pain their enemies forced them to go through. The citizens sigh in exhaustion, wondering where the enemy actually is, as the war is already over. Such is their daily life. Hank asks Liza if she's gotten what he asked for, and says he'll move when night comes. Shaw looks around, disturbed by the destruction around her. Still unable to understand what happened, the lieutenant tells the girl to follow her. They're soon surrounded by tents, where the displaced citizens live. While the incarnates won the war, the military must still work hard to secure the livelihood of the people. She asks what he's battling against alone. However, it's something only those who share the same fate can answer. The lieutenant takes out what Hank asked for. It's a god-killer bullet replica, capable of killing incarnates. At night, Shal enters the captain's room. She runs to him as he winces in pain and calls out for Elaine. Waking up from the nightmare, he immediately gets dressed and prepares for the battle. She accompanies him to the fortress, promising not to cause trouble. While walking through, she's in awe of what was built so fast, and he warns her to be careful of wandering around. Scattered all over the place are skeletons that fell to countless traps. Backing away in fear, she stumbled and landed on a trigger, nearly losing her life to a razor disc. Pushing forward, Hank talks about Theo, the incarnate, saying he used to be cowardly. Back then, he often trembled, afraid of dying like the others. His captain said he felt the same and calmed himself down by doing all he could to prepare for battle. In retrospect, the fortress building was a lesson from him. They reach the entrance, where Shal is left behind. Hearing her cries to join, Liza appears and says she'll really die if she goes further. With things settled, the lieutenant goes to take her back, just as the captain asked. Remembering how he killed her father, she's determined to understand why he's intent on killing the incarnates. Seeing her desperation, the older woman helps her get through, poking around to find the door's switch. Hank reaches the middle of the fortress, where his former squad member welcomes him with a laugh. Theo proudly shows off his fortress, saying they don't have to fear enemies anymore. Paranoia fills his head as he thinks about enemies in the shadow and ones disguised as children. Humoring the madness that's enveloped him, the captain readies his lance and says he's the enemy that's come for him. They both transform, and the Minotaur activates the cannons throughout the arena. He dodges the blasts, but is sent back by the beast's horns. The ground beneath him crumbles. As the fortress shakes from the blasts, the two women hurry to the arena. On the way, Shal asks what kind of incarnate Hank is. 
wondering why he looks human all the time. Before she could answer, they reached the clearing and saw the captain lying on the rubble. Theo jumps down to end him, ignoring the girl's cries about their history of camaraderie. Liza says there's no need to worry. Just then, he catches the Minotaur's axe with one hand and pushes it back completely. Hank is one of the few incarnates that only show their true strength at night. With the moonlight shining down, he transforms into his real form, the werewolf, and claws the enemy's face. Seeing his blood, Theo is reminded of the countless corpses he encountered and activates all the traps in the area. He built it and fortified everything, but can't understand why the fear won't go away. Sent flying by a trap, the captain dives down and cuts through the Minotaur's body. As their battle ends, Theo realizes that he's about to die and feels an unfamiliar peace at the thought of death. It's as if he's gone back in time, before the war. Telling him to rest, the captain pulls the trigger. Finally understanding what Hank is doing, she wonders what her father's last words to him were. In the city, a fallen incarnate is paraded around, indicating the success of the incarnate extermination squad. Coupe Day, Captain Claude, the new hero, is set on hunting every beast down. In a dungeon somewhere, Kane looks at a photo of Hank and Shal and says fate seems to be on the captain's side. At night, the ground rumbles and trees fall. A camper looks up and sees a beast towering over the forest. Shal excitedly looks around the train and tells a man how it's her first time riding one. The train rides along the mountain and a huge bridge comes into view. It's the largest in the continent, said to be the structure that connects the north and south following the reunification. In addition to carrying people and cargo, it's a symbol that upholds their peace. Hearing this, she looks at Hank, who said that the war didn't end at all. The train suddenly stops, as the tracks are blocked by Liza and her men. She enters the vehicle and bursts through the cars to speak to Hank, telling him to come as the behemoth is moving faster than anticipated. Their target is five kilometers away and rapidly moving to the east. If things continue, it'll soon crash into the Iron Bridge, the symbol of peace. They have no idea what the Incarnate's motive is. What's more, steadily injuring it with cannons will only allow it to regrow injured areas stronger. A fatal hit with their current equipment is impossible, but they're still away. The sun begins to fall, and they signal the behemoth's arrival. As it appears with a roar, the captain reminds them to follow the plan. They shoot cannons at its body, while Hank dashes to face the Incarnate. While its body is hardened from recovering so much, the joints behind that are protected are left completely soft. His lance blasts it open, and the behemoth falls immediately. With this, the battle is won, and the men tie it down. Meanwhile, Lisa tells Shal about the Incarnate, and how it has consciously avoided populated cities to avoid hurting anyone. Even the soldiers who were injured weren't hurt by direct attacks. Hoping that he has some humanity left, the girl approaches the Incarnate, introducing herself as Will's daughter. She tries to convince it to turn back, but it raises its head and looks forward, meaning its goal is up ahead. A rail president appears on the site and complains about the beast still being alive. Despite their attempt to explain, he insists on blowing everything up and threatening to do it himself. Hank sternly says that he has no intention to change his plans. As the men leave, grumbling, the captain orders the soldiers to proceed. Things should be prepared by tomorrow, but he asks them to add explosives at a certain spot just in case. Shal then asks about the Incarnate. He's Artie, a silent man who always followed orders and never complained. She shares that there must be a reason he's heading east, but it doesn't matter, as the captain went there to kill him, not help. She argues that he's avoiding people on purpose and might have humanity left. However, moving forward will destroy the bridge that supports the peace they worked so hard to achieve. As Incarnates from the past, they mustn't destroy it. She protests, saying he's just like everyone else who's trying to live in the peaceful age. Believing that it's unfair, she runs away. Unfortunately, even Liza says there's nothing to do, as he poses too big of a risk to everyone, regardless of the bridge. The best they could do is to ensure a death with minimal suffering. At night, the soldiers are tied up by the rail company's men. Explosives go off at the behemoth spot, and the men smile in satisfaction. However, they're stunned as the Incarnate stands strong and charges forward to stomp on them all. Left with no choice, Hank decides to take him out on the spot. Asking about any leftover explosives, he reminds a soldier about the spot he told him about. Dashing to the valley, he faces Artie, 
who suddenly stops his advance. With inhumane power, the captain is single-handedly holding him back, even toppling him over to the side. Receiving the signal, the soldiers detonate the bombs by the cliff, burying the beast in boulders. Incapacitated, it opens up the path for another set of explosives, which hit the behemoth in its chest and blast it open. After kicking the captain away, it drags its innards across the ground and stops as it sees Shawl on the bridge. They beg it to stop, pleading to any humanity left in him. Just then, more explosives go off, but from far past the bridge, the cliff collapses and reveals the glistening sea. Seeing this, Artie's eyes well with tears, and he falls down satisfied. Later, Hank shares how he once told him that he longed to see the ocean, even just once. His captain promised that he'd see it once peace came. While he granted his wish, he's also the one who took his life. With this, Shal understands his purpose better. Later, Liza reports that a man matching Kane's description was sighted, igniting Hank's fury. In the city, a couple of girls spot Kane and approach him to offer a good time. He comes close to her and bites her neck. She falls unconscious for a moment, but quickly attacks her companion, ripping her neck out. Complaining of a dull night, he walks off with the little girl beside him. They reach White Church City, and Liza brings them to a blood-stained street, saying it's where Cain was sighted. He kills people every night, and most attacks happen on that street. They begin to ask around, wanting to gather information. However, everyone refuses to speak to them, especially after hearing that they're with the military, blaming them as the slums got worse after the war. As their search is unsuccessful through the night, Shal asks the captain about what he said before, but he avoids the conversation. Looking at the hole in his robe, she remembers when she shot him. In the foggy alleys, a woman desperately runs from the creature chasing her. Unfortunately, she trips and falls to its sharp talons. Back in the inn, Shal is sewing the robe's bullet hole. With his permission, she continues, and shares that she would often sew the children's clothes in the orphanage. He shares that he grew up in an orphanage as well, and was the clumsy type who had to be taken care of. He remembers Elaine, who often sewed his clothes. The girl in front reminds him of his old friend. She asks if it's someone named Elaine, recalling how he said her name while having a nightmare. She wanted to take responsibility for the incarnates losing their souls over time. However, Cain killed her and released the incarnates into the world. They could lose control and harm people at any moment. As their former captain, he wishes to slay them while they're still humans. As the girl is deep in thought, Liza suddenly bursts into the room, saying there's been another attack. In the middle of the street, a woman's bloodied corpse is nailed to the wall. Considering the wounds, it's a case similar to the ones before. That said, Hank is sure that it wasn't Kane's doing. Suddenly, someone named Andy screams that the culprit is the demon statue. The captain approaches, and he leads them to an old church where he saw the monster enter. The enemy is the gargoyle incarnate Topher. Among everyone in the squad, he had the highest sense of justice, often uplifting their spirits. Andy confirms their plans to kill the incarnate and runs away after Liza asks to speak with him. Shal goes after him, having something to talk about. She catches up to Andy, but he walks off while ignoring her pestering questions. He then questions why she's hanging with the military, so she shares how Hank killed her incarnate father. While her feelings for him are unclear, her desire for answers is stronger than anything else. The more she encountered incarnates, the more she realized how human they were. He walks away, snatching an apple from a busy vendor, and says he lost his mother to the gargoyle as well. Just then, the incarnate appears, after seeing the boy steal. Topher insists that he exists to punish criminals and free them from sin. Remembering the captain's words, she pleads that he fight against the darkness in his soul. Triggered, it charges at her. Fortunately, Hank intercepts and tackles it to the wall. Considering him a sinner, Topher flies back to the church, inviting him to come. The captain winces at the slashes on his side, caused by protecting Shal. The gargoyle looks over the tainted city. Cain appears, encouraging him to make it all disappear. As the former comrade immediately rejects him, he places a god-killer bullet on the table and warns him of its effects. Before heading out, Hank tells Shal to leave immediately if he doesn't return by dawn. At the church, he's welcomed by several corpses, hanging from the ceiling. Topher proudly shows off the punishment he's dealt, and his furious captain charges at him. However, he's taken by a surprise attack. In the inn, the girl sees her rifle missing, 
and realizes that Andy has run out with it. Transformed into a werewolf, the two incarnates clash, arguing about what justice is. Topher recalls the war and how he would strike down invaders for peace. A ceasefire was ridiculous to him. While complaining, the werewolf strikes the gargoyle down. However, a godkiller bullet suddenly hits the captain's side, and he's stunned as he transforms back to his human self. His former member goes on about how being an incarnate is an opportunity to become stronger than humans, Hank argues, saying he's a beast with no one to call his name. The gargoyle recalls a memory of when he approached a boy who stole a bag. Despite kindly offering to teach him about justice, the boy saw nothing but his appearance. Suddenly, Andy appeared in the church, but was easily kicked away. Topher sees Shal coming to aid him, and remembers how he had to kill the boy from before as he tried to stab him with a knife. He comes close to end the two, but Hank takes the bullet out of his body and charges at the gargoyle as a werewolf. He drives his claws through the incarnate's chest and aims the gun at his head. Insistent with his version of justice, his life ends in a flash. Shal questions why they all turn out like that, and the captain says their power is simply too much for one person. She runs to him as he falls from his injuries, but finds herself bound by strings. Kane appears and says that the bullet that shot him was a gift to commemorate their reunion. Elizabeth, a spider incarnate, tranquilizes Shal. They take her away, leaving only an event invitation and a promise to return the girl if he attends. The little girl hands Hank an invitation and they promise to return Shal if he shows up to the party. The captain dreams of the night of Kane's betrayal and the sight of Elaine's lifeless body falling in front of him. He wakes up at the inn, and Andy arrives to check on his condition. With questions filling his head, he asks about the girl's kidnapping, and if the strange people are working with the gargoyle. As he panics, the captain assures him that he'll save their friend. In a mansion, the little girl walks around Shal, who's bound to a chair. She introduces herself as Migliaglia, ignoring the captive's questions. She fawns over her blue eyes, about to say something about them when Elizabeth suddenly enters the room. Seeing her spooked expression, she tells the girl to calm down and releases her from the bindings. Asked why she's traveling with their captain, she explains that her father was an incarnate. Realizing that she's Will's daughter, she finds her foolish for staying with the man who killed her father. For now, she's nothing but bait to draw the captain there. Believing that she's just a straggler to him, she says he has no reason to come. Finding her adorable, Elizabeth tears her clothes open, saying they'll have her ready for him. At the church, the incarnate extermination squad sees the gargoyle's corpse, as Liza says he must have been killed by angry villagers. The others report that neither Cain nor Hank are in the area. The corpses from the church are recovered, but there's one that looks different. Instead of slashes, bits of a man's body are missing, as if chewed on by a beast. Claude asks to see a corpse from the same day, so he's shown the man's wife, whose cause of death is unclear. Taking a closer look at her neck, he sees two holes and realizes that she devoured her husband while under Kane's manipulation. Asking where their mansion is, he orders Liza to investigate it immediately and gathers the rest of their troops for battle. Following the invitation, Hank arrives at the mansion. There, several lavish-looking people stare at him with contempt. One approaches and asks him to mind his attire on his next visit. They all clap as Kane appears and welcomes the people who share his ideals. Telling them to ignore those blinded by false happiness, he reminds them of the war, where the economy collapsed and took everything from rich folks. Moreover, they ended the war with peace, taking away the opportunity to rise from the rubble. They all cry out in agreement as he goes on about the peace, considering it a loss for those who were winning the war. Criticizing the government, he sparks a rebellion and thanks them all for the contributions they've made so far. As he says that it's time to continue the war, incarnates pour out into the hall, leaving everyone in awe. However, he adds that it's also time for them to perish, and commands the beasts to kill everyone there. Hank temporarily stops the massacre by killing an incarnate. Kane questions why they have to die, furious at the humans who exploited them out of greed and treated them like mindless beasts. He then argues against the vow they pushed for, saying there's no need to live and die as selfish humans and should just exist as their hearts decide. Unable to accept his murderous ideals, the captain readies his blade for the inevitable fight. Just then, the incarnation extermination squad bursts through the windows and immediately gets to work. With seamless coordination, 
They take the beasts down one by one. Claude confronts Cain and is revealed to be his little brother. He's then surrounded by various incarnates. Despite doing his best to evade, he gets knocked back. Fortunately, Hank saves him and gives his men enough time to come to his aid. As the mastermind Delightful watches his former captain fight, a huge bullet suddenly shoots through his chest. Capitalizing on the opening, Hank follows through, throws his spear right at Kane's face, and blasts half his body off. However, the vampire incarnate is an immortal being of the night. With his body restored, he calls for Elizabeth and Shal, whom he points a gun at, threatening to take away those that hinder his captain. Enraged, the werewolf transforms and charges at them, but is caught in the spider's powerful web. The deputy is reminded of the night he betrayed them and pulls the trigger. As she falls, the image of Elaine's body hitting the ground plays through Hank's mind. Seething, he lets out a frenzied howl as his body grows bigger and stronger. Maniacally delighted, Cain encourages the transformation and tells him to assume his true form by tearing off the bonds of Gleipnir. Shackles inside the captain break and he takes on the form of a colossal wolf. Blasting off the roof, he glows in power under the moonlit sky. As his howl becomes a roar, the unleashed beast leaps into the city. At the infirmary, Liza tells Claude that he's lucky to be alive. Looking around, he sees his men, barely alive from their injuries. They go out, and the hero is shocked to see a path of destruction plowed right through the middle of the city. The lieutenant says Hank and Kane have both gone missing. Just then, men carry Shal's body, and Liza calls out desperately as she sees the bullet hole in her body. The whole white church is reduced to a ruin after the fight with the incarnates. Shal is standing in the middle of the wreckage, recovering from the injuries she sustained. The destruction of white church was as shocking to Patria as the previous war, but two weeks later, another event rocked the town. Cain addresses the people, urging them to create a new Patria and bridge the divide between north and south, promising the incarnates as allies. Soldiers and dissatisfied nobles rally behind him, while Cain and his followers establish their independence in the West. Meanwhile, the Northern Union of Patria prepares for war, fearing incarnate alliances with rebels and ordering the execution of all remaining incarnates. Thus, the cycle of war resumes. After six months, Shal goes back to her village, where people are wary of her coming back. As she looks at her almost dilapidated home, she thinks back to the time when she was gunned down by Cain. The doctors discovered that she was saved because her dress was made of an incarnate's thread that blocked the bullet. She was interrogated after she woke up and learned that Hank was stripped of his rank after the incident at Whitechurch, and he is being located by the army. At present, Shal puts flowers at her father's tomb. She talks to him about his comrades and the burden they all had to bear, asking for her father's guidance on what she must do when she sees Hank again. As she goes back to the town, Shal sees Liza along with Coupe Day working to eliminate an incarnate seen in the mountains nearby. While Claude talks to the town leader about their mission to assassinate the incarnate, Shal intervenes, wanting to join their squad up in the mountains. The coup day commander recognizes her as the girl traveling with Hank, and with Liza's recommendation, he agrees to make her their guide as she knows the area. At their base camp, Claude apologizes to Shal for failing to protect her during the attack at the White Church. Having heard the conversation, Liza walks over, teases the young commander for being a softie, and playfully throws herself at him. She also reveals to Shal that he is the son of President Patria. Just then, heavy trudges coming from deep in the mountains are approaching them. Shal is shocked to see her father revived from death and rotting away in front of her. In disbelief, she approaches her father, but the dragon attacks her in a frenzied state. Claude jumps in to save her, shielding her from the beast's wrath. The squad appears firing at the incarnate, but it has no effect, and the beast gets away. While Liza is briefing the case, Claude learns that the Nidhogg is Shal's father, and that Hank killed the beast before. However, due to its immense power, the incarnate rose from its grave and is wreaking havoc again. He commands his troops to prepare to kill the monster before it causes casualties again. Meanwhile, Shal is gazing at the picture of his father when Liza approaches her, and asks about what kind of father Will was. The young lady reminisces about her father as a calm and caring gentleman. He joined the war to protect the children at the orphanage, wanting to have power that could end the war. Hearing her story, Liza advises her to go back to town and exclude herself from the mission. However, Shal realizes she shouldn't run away from her problems like her father wouldn't. 
Liza then gives her a box of godkiller bullets and asks her to be mentally prepared. As the night grows deeper, the squad is all prepared to take down the Nidhogg. When it finally emerges, they immediately commence an attack, but all their efforts prove futile as they struggle to restrain the beast. In an attempt to evade the attacks, it takes off for the town. Claude tries to gun down the Incarnate, but it retaliates by breathing fire in his direction. Before the people could evacuate, the Incarnate reached the town, endangering the civilians. Witnessing her father set the town he once cherished on fire, she confronts him, knowing it goes against everything he stood for. She aims the rifle his father gifted her and pulls the trigger. The monster continues to approach as it yelps in pain, making Shal continuously fire while crying. As it falls to the ground, Nidhogg regains its sanity at the last moment of its life. He reaches out to Shal before passing away peacefully. The next day, Shal is watching as the army covers his father's remains when Liza comes to her. She shares that she is somewhat comforted by the fact that she was able to bid her father goodbye. As Liza comforts her, she wonders if there are other ways to save the incarnates and decides to help find Hank to get more answers. She asks Ku Dei to let her come along in their quest to find Hank, saying she wants to do something to assist him. Claude agrees to let Shal join them, saying they don't know exactly where Hank is, but promising they'll find him together. A woman is singing beautifully in front of her audience, completely enchanting them. As a girl hands her flowers, her memories shift to a version of her as a winged siren sitting on a boulder in the middle of a sea. In his office, the president orders all the incarnates to be eliminated within three months. After exiting his office, his two subordinates talk about how the president is putting all the pressure on Claude and wants to use him as a pawn in his political affairs. Meanwhile, Claude is waiting at the port for their equipment to arrive, but his subordinate tells him that it will take time before the shipments arrive, making him frustrated. Shal helps Liza buy goods at the market and later goes to the beach to sightsee. Suddenly, she hears a mysterious singing voice and follows it all the way to a cave. There, she sees a singing incarnate and becomes enchanted by her voice. Just then, a man emerges and points a gun at her, telling her to leave and forget everything she saw. The incarnate intervenes, telling the man named Charles to lower his gun. Charles reprimands the woman, calling her Trice, for singing, as it will expose her. Shawl introduces herself as Will's daughter, and the siren immediately remembers her comrade. As they settle down, Shal tells Trice the last moments of her father, and she learns that the siren is being haunted by the townsfolk. Trice reveals her past as a singer in Charles's bar, but when the war happened, people ceased listening to her songs. Then one day, the government told her that she had a special power, so she decided to help end the war so she could perform again. However, when the war ended, she discovered that no one wanted to hear her sing because everyone saw her as a monster. Sympathizing with her, Shal offers her friendship, and she starts visiting every day, bringing the incarnate gifts. Meanwhile, Kane seems to be preparing for his move by building a fort at Bold Creek. When Shal is on her way back, Claude warns her not to walk alone because people are still wary of the soldiers. He adds that he wants to leave the port as soon as possible so he can exterminate all the incarnates immediately. She asks his reason for doing his mission, and the young man shares that it is all because he wants to defeat his brother, Kane. Charles plays the piano alone in the tavern and recalls the time when Trice was a singer for him, but he encounters several men in town with rifles who ask him if he is hiding Trice. They engage in a fight, causing the tavern to burn and a sound of rifles ringing. In the cave, Trice hears Charles come in and says she plans to leave town until people can accept her again and she can sing for them. However, she finds him gravely wounded in the stomach. Charles warns her to run, as the men from town will haunt her soon. He then begs her not to blame the townspeople because they are just exhausted from the effects and memories of war. He holds her face, apologizing that he can't play the piano for her again, and dies. Later, Trice walks around the town, singing and putting the people to sleep. Claude and his squad recognize the ability of the incarnate siren and start to locate her by following her voice. Claude finds her, but he gets affected by her singing voice. Just then, Shal intervenes, wanting to know why she's putting people to sleep. The siren tells her that she uses her singing to put people to sleep, so they will never have to fear war again. However, Shal tells her that what she's doing is wrong. Hearing this, the siren regains her humanity, but Claude shot and wounded her, revealing that he stabbed himself in the leg to stay sane. The injured incarnate flies away and goes to the tavern, where Shal follows her. 
Being on her old stage, Trice reminisces about the time when the place gave her strength, but now no one will listen to her songs. She bet that even Shal would not want to listen to her singing because she is a monster. The young woman denies this and requests to hear her sing. At this time, Claude arrives and orders his troops to shoot Trice down. Shal begs the commander to let Trice sing the last time, saying that she meant no harm. The siren finishes her song and is sent back to the time when she was the star of the tavern, singing beautifully to her audience. As she sings the last lyrics, Trice falls and is held by Shal, who tells her that her song was beautiful. She passed away peacefully shortly after hearing this. The next day, Kude boards their cargo, preparing to leave the port. Claude tells Shal that Hank's traces were found in the central mountains. She is shocked by this, but the commander warns her that he will consider shooting her down if she gets in the way again. Meanwhile, Hank is in the snowy mountains and is in a fight with another incarnate. He starts to transform into his werewolf form, but then remembers the damage he caused to the White Church. Afraid to make the same mistake, he reverts to his human form and uses explosives to kill the incarnate. He promises to fulfill his own and trudges down the snowy path. Meanwhile, another incarnate is following him. In his weakening state, Hank is walking slowly in the snowy mountains. Out of exhaustion, he falls and has visions of the comrades he killed, consuming him. He continues on with his journey, determined to fulfill his oath, when suddenly, the incarnate Garm charges at him and bites his shoulder. The beast then throws him on the ground, asks why he declined Cain's invitation to work with them, and threatens to kill him if he keeps on resisting. Hank feels ironic that Garm would speak threatening words and pick up his weapon again to fight. However, disadvantaged because he was fighting in his human form, he used a grenade to cause an explosion and escape quickly into the woods. At the same time, Coupe Day was also looking for Hank's whereabouts in the snowy mountains. Shal remembers that Claude ordered her to eliminate Hank on sight, thinking she must do something to prevent it. Meanwhile, Hank is spotted by Garm, hiding behind the trees by his smell. Holding a gun loaded with godkiller bullets and a knife, he braces himself for the beast's attack. Unexpectedly, Garm remains unscathed by the bullet and uses its claws to knock Hank to the ground, causing him to bleed and lose consciousness. Garm urges Hank to fight in his incarnate form, warning him to stop underestimating his abilities. As the sun rises and Hank's incarnate powers wane, Garm decides to leave the woods, reminding Hank not to forget his true identity as their duel isn't over yet. Meanwhile, while Kude continues their search in the snowy mountains, Claude's injuries from the last fight cause him to fall unconscious and to contract fever. The team halts their journey in front of an abandoned fortress known as Muzzle Peak Lookout to tend to Claude's wounds. When Claude awakens later in the afternoon, he sees Shal tending to him. Alarmed that they're running out of time, he tries to get up and continue their search. However, Shal stops him, assuring him that his team is doing their best so he doesn't have to worry. He asks her why she's determined to save the incarnates when she has witnessed the countless lives taken by the monsters. She notes that they didn't choose the circumstances they find themselves in, and believes they would have fared better if they had humans to back them up, much like Trice did. She elaborates that her goal is to seek a solution for incarnates and humans to coexist peacefully, and to discover a method to restore incarnates to their human form. Meanwhile, Liza is listening to their conversation when Gerald arrives and reports to Claude that they discovered the whereabouts of Hank and an unknown incarnate, and evidence that the two incarnates engaged in a fight. The commander orders a strategy meeting to capture Hank. On the other hand, Hank dreams of being shackled by his subordinates when Kane appears and frees him. He transforms into his Gleipnir form and starts killing everyone, including Elaine. When he wakes up, he finds Garm atop a tree, telling him they should resume their fight now that it's nighttime. Just as Claude is about to set off with his exhausted body, Gerlad offers to take over, which is supported by Liza, who reprimands the commander for not knowing when to rest. Shal then decides to go with Gerald's troop to find Hank. In his room, Liza tries to help Claude remove his clothes, much to his embarrassment. She sits beside him and tells him that Shal wanted to kill Hank at first, but decided to find out more before doing so, making her more reasonable than all of them. Meanwhile, Hank fights with Garm, who wants him to transform into his ultimate form, but Hank resists doing so. Garm calls him weak and picks him up by his neck. The beast tells him that his will and honor are all gone. However, Hank tells him he's wrong, as he's the one who became deplorable by being Cain's dog, 
Angered by this, Garm injures Hank, sinking its claws into his chest. Due to the unbearable pain, Hank transforms into his werewolf form, which makes Garm laugh. Hank starts attacking him and losing control. However, his dream of killing Elaine restrains him, causing him to fight his urges and howls. The sound is heard by Coop Day, who prepares to head over the two incarnates' locations. Hank transforms back into his human form, which frustrates Garm, who repeatedly smashes him to the ground. When he gets no response from the man, the beast throws him and steps on his body repeatedly, saying that his oath alone could not save them. As Garm prepares to strike Hank fatally, the coup d'etat troops suddenly arrive and launch an assault on the creature. However, their attack inadvertently triggers the cliff where Hank lies to start crumbling. In panic, Shal cries out for Hank and rushes after him as he plunges off the cliff into the dark depths of the canyon below. Garm recalls his past life as Roy, a soldier who stormed an enemy base, sustaining severe injuries and collapsing to the ground. However, while receiving medical care after the onslaught, he became an incarnate. When he opened his eyes, Hank was the first person he saw. They promised to end the war together and fight alongside each other against their enemies, which made Garm proud. In the present day, Garm watches Hank as the man lies unresponsive on the snowy ground. The beast flees as the coup day fires at him, making Hank fall down below. In his dream, Hank sees Elaine and holds her close. He slowly regains consciousness and sees Shal beside him. The man is surprised by Shal's presence, asking why she's with him. Meanwhile, the rest of the squad pursues Garm, who has been wounded by the repeated bullets, as they see him with new night vision goggles. Garm fights back, eliminating half of the squad. Meanwhile, at the base, Liza asks one of the reinforcements about Shal. However, when she didn't receive any information, she decided to go to the battlefield herself. Claude appears, volunteering to join with her despite his condition to help save everyone. On the other hand, Hank feels relieved once he knows the story of Shal and is just happy to see her alive. She also tells him that her father was suddenly resurrected and transformed into a beast shortly after the White Church incident, which shocks Hank as he's sure he killed the man. She also shares that when her father tried to attack the village, she shot him and was able to say goodbye for the last time. She now fully understands how Hank felt when he killed her father and understands that he did so to prevent her father from turning into a beast and causing destruction. Hearing this, Hank remembers Garm's words, saying he failed to save them all. He cries as he remembers his fallen comrades that he fought alongside. Tormented by the memories, he requests Shal to kill him, wanting to die with his memories of how his friends used to be. However, she refuses. Seeing her agony, Hank apologizes for asking her and prepares to leave to finish his fight with Garm. Before leaving, he asks Shal to don't forget about the incarnates when they are all eliminated. Meanwhile, back on the battlefield, Garm attacks the remaining soldiers and grabs Gerald with his massive claws. He threatens to kill the commander. However, it's a trap for the beast, as Gerald planned on being captured. The reinforcement troops surrounded and pinned him in place by wires through his body. They shoot at Garm, but the creature isn't fatally wounded. As he moves to attack Gerald, Claude suddenly appears and strikes him with a grenade launcher, causing the beast to flee. Claude is unable to stand without Liza's help and berates Gerald for his dangerous plan. Gerald apologizes to his commander, smiling at his concern. Inside the cave, Shal recalls her experience following Hank on his journey. She finally understood what kind of pain Hank had to endure in eliminating his comrades. Not wanting him to wish for death, she walks out of the cave to follow him. Meanwhile, Garm stands limping by the river, weakened from blood loss as Hank approaches from the other side. Not realizing Hank's plan, Garm charges to attack, but the man holds a grenade, intending to take both of them out. Just as he prepares to sacrifice himself, Shal intervenes, shooting Garm in the knee with a shotgun. Shal tells Hank that he was human in her eyes, and she promised to kill him if he suddenly transformed into a beast and lost control, and that is her oath. As she loads her rifle, she asks Hank to continue his mission to kill the many dehumanized incarnates and save their human souls. She also asks Hank to fulfill his oath and fight to the last moment. Shal's words gave Hank a glimmer of hope and cheered him up again. Hank understood that perhaps what his heart really wanted to hear was someone's sympathy. As Garm is about to attack Shal, Hank transforms into a werewolf again, and the two fight. The coup d'etat troops approach cautiously, with Claude instructing them to hold their positions. 
Hank overpowers Garm in an intense battle, delivering a fatal blow by impaling his monstrous claw in his subordinate's chest. Garm commends Hank's prowess and briefly reverts to his human form as Roy, reminiscing about their past on the battlefield. To end his misery, Hank shoots Roy, leaving him lifeless. Shal asks Hank about Roy's past because she wants to remember what kind of person he was. He describes Roy as a soldier who was always proud to do his missions and was friendly to everyone. He says that if they could go back in time, they might be friends. I remember the time when Roy saw the picture of young Shal and was excited about meeting her. Soon after, Claude has his men point guns at Hank, saying they can finally talk. The Patria soldiers discover a newly constructed new Patria fortress at Bold Creek, only to be targeted by Miles, the incarnate centaur, and his sniper skills. A week later, a council convenes at Patria's capital to discuss the strategic threat posed by New Patria's direct access to the central mountains and the capital. The army mobilizes to dismantle the fortress, causing unrest among the populace. Meanwhile, in the basement of Muzzle Peak Lookout, Claude interrogates Hank, pressing him for information on the remaining incarnate's abilities, weaknesses, and hideouts, as well as insights into his brother Kane's rebellion motives. Hank knows that Claude is Kane's brother, but he explains to Claude that he only knows how to stop Kane in order for everything to end. Shaw intervenes, urging Claude and Hank to collaborate as they have shared goals, and she promises to prevent another White Church incident, even if it costs her life. Gerald interrupts, informing Claude of an order from the president to head to Bold Creek, where Kane's fortress is located. The coup day journeys to the Bold Creek, with Hank disguised in their uniform to conceal his incarnate identity. They reach the joint camp and meet Colonel Martin Wall, who is in charge of the operation. When Martin explains how Miles had thwarted their operation, Hank confirms that the Minotaur is an impressive sniper and excellent at defending his base. Hank suggests a night assault, as the Minotaur can't snipe at night. As the night falls, the soldiers try to aim in the dark, but they have problems with their vision as well. Just then, the Minotaur incarnate charges at the soldiers and shoots his arrows but misses, so he chooses to fight head-on and impales the soldiers. Hank transforms and fights the Minotaur. The beast expresses his disappointment with the people who treated them as monsters instead of heroes, saying he sided with Cain to reclaim their former glory. Hank runs away from him, and they run through the forest, where they set a trap for Miles. The coup day surrounds him and fires relentlessly. However, although he was shot by the soldiers, his wound suddenly healed, which shocked Hank. Miles tells him he has achieved immortality and evacuates the battlefield to continue their fight some other time. The next day, as the military prepares to dig a trench, Martin explains that his men thought they saw the second incarnate fighting Miles, but he laughed it off, saying that his men were surely just seeing things. Meanwhile, Shaw lets out a big sigh, as she can't be of any use during the battle. Liza sees her and tells her to help carry medical supplies. At the Bold Creek Fortress, Miles bandages a wounded soldier's arm and is thanked by him. Kane, watching, is amused as the once-renowned doctor is now killing people. Miles shrugs this off, saying that he gets to be thanked regardless. As his eyes glow, devoid of humanity, he says it's quicker to kill the enemy. On the other hand, a mysterious cargo from the headquarters arrives at Martin's office, making all of his preparations to attack the fortress now complete. Shal and Hank share a conversation by the fire at night, where he quickly becomes more relaxed and laughs, revealing how much he has opened up. Shal observes that he used to be distant, but now he can smile at her. Hank playfully teases her about their first encounter when she shot him, which embarrasses the girl. They both laugh, and Hank reflects on how his determination to achieve his goal has been his driving force. Shal insists that he must return alive, and Hank promises her that he will. As the morning comes, Patria launches an attack on the new Patria fortress, resulting in casualties on both sides. As the sun sets, Miles emerges and causes significant damage, impaling soldiers with his weapon until a tripwire brings him down. Hank then detonated his spear, severing Miles' arm. Miles reflected on his past as a battlefield surgeon, feeling disillusioned by the futility of saving wounded soldiers who were sent back to die. However, working with the Incarnates allowed him to save lives by eliminating enemy soldiers. As Miles' arm regrew and Hank transformed into a werewolf at sunset, they engaged in battle, prompting Martin to order the deployment of a secret weapon. Elizabeth brings Miglieglia to a graveyard to resurrect a large number of the dead under Kane's instructions. 
Back on the battlefield, the fight between Hank and Miles ensues. Hank uses Miles' spear to pin him down and gives the signal for the army to open fire. The soldiers unleash their onslaught, but Miles' body endures the attack. Suddenly, purple mists envelop Miles, causing his body to disintegrate. Hank realizes they have been surrounded by the poison of Abby, the Hydra incarnate, which starts to kill the soldiers too. He warns them to get away from the poisonous mists immediately. At the base, Martin notes that his plan appears to have gone well. He tells Claude that a new weapon was created after researching the incarnate Hydra's corpse called Alphard, which is a gift from the president himself. Claude reprimands Martin for causing casualties, disregarding the lives of their subordinates to eliminate their target. However, Martin reiterates that they're in a war and they need to do everything to win. Miles continues to disintegrate and is gunned down by Hank to end his suffering. Kane shows up at Martin's camp and uses his ability to slaughter the soldiers. He confronts Martin and disintegrate, who and he shawl to hide. Martin's soldiers attempt to shoot Kane, but they are quickly annihilated. Martin orders the soldiers to use Claude, but Kane manipulates them into fighting each other, making the grenades detonate. Seeing the explosion from afar, Hank rushes to the base to save Shal. Kane manipulates Martin into swallowing Alphard, calling his tactic dirty. The commander quickly disintegrates upon consuming the poison. Even though he's shaking from fear, Claude declares war against his brother and wants to fight with him. He charges at Instruct but his brother evades by grabbing his sword. Just as when Claude is about to be killed, Hank arrives and attacks Kane. Calling them fools, Kane reveals that his fortress is only a decoy as he takes over the capital and prevents the alliance between South and North Patria from taking down his new Patria. He orders the other incarnates to annihilate the Southern leaders and invade the South. Kane convinces Hank that humans are vile creatures who abandon them after using them as the greatest weapon to win the war. He tells Hank that he should be thanking him for killing Grenades, who created him, since she was planning to discard them all. Hank denies this, saying Elaine had to make up for her mistakes by creating the Incarnates and preparing to be hated by everyone. Hank explains that both humans and Incarnates are bound to make mistakes, and as long as they can correct their mistakes and save everything, they can gain true salvation. However, Cain declares that what's truly righteous is decided by those who so he's going to continue living as he desires. Hearing this, Hank transforms into his werewolf form and swiftly attacks Cain. However, Cain shows impressive healing ability, so the werewolf's attacks are futile. The vampire incarnate urges him to transform into his Gleipnir form so they can have an exciting battle. Hank attacks Cain, but he evades by multiplying, which surprises the former. The two resume fighting, with Kane's new abilities putting Hank at a disadvantage. Hank sustains many injuries, and as the sun rises, he can no longer maintain his werewolf form. Kane wounds him, and expresses his hope that he can survive and become his comrade as the King of Beasts, creating a new era for incarnates. Shal rushes to Hank's side and helps him to get up. Seeing this, Kane remembers how Elaine chose Hank over him, angering the vampire. He then attacks Shal, but Hank intervenes and intercepts his attack. He then unleashes his unknown awakened power and knocks Kane to the ground with his powerful punch. Just then, Hank depletes his energy and falls to his knees. While injured, Kane laughs, saying that the power of the King of Beasts surpasses all that the Incarnates created. When Kane discovers that the fortress is already captured, he bids goodbye to Hank and Shal, but tells them that they will meet again on a new battlefield before disappearing. Meanwhile, the North was able to avoid the impending attack on their capital. However, Kane took control of the Western and Southern Patria, making the new Patria the strongest nation. Realizing this, the President declared a state of emergency and recalled all his forces back to the capital to prepare for a counterattack. On the other hand, Hank and Shal prepare to depart from the fortress, with Lisa assuring Shal that they will extend their support after addressing the aftermath with the army. As the soldiers bid farewell to Hank and Shal, Claude and Gerald decide to enlist the duo's help in defeating all the incarnates. During their journey, Hank asks the girl if she is prepared for a long battle. Shal assures him that she has discovered her purpose and wants to fulfill the promises they've made to each other. Meanwhile, Cain gazes at Elaine's body, confined in a glass enclosure. Holding a mysterious crystal, he tells her that the new world she wanted to destroy will soon arrive. 